This TEDx talk was originally given in front of a live audience on the Duke University campus in Page Auditorium on February 26, 2022. Unfortunately, uh, the YouTube video was censored due to content violation uh, and never released. And that's why I'm recording it again for you now. It's a privilege to share this information on the spiritual alphabet soup of death and dying. This two-story building uh, is the home of the Rhine Research Center, uh, located about a mile off of Duke's West Campus. It was formerly known as the Duke Parapsychology Laboratory prior to 1964, when Dr. Rhine, psychology professor, retired and moved the lab off campus. It also houses the international headquarters of IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. And I've been an active member of both of these organizations for many years. Sometimes when I go out to dinner before one of our monthly meetings with my friends, I'm sitting around the table and I realize I think I'm the only one who hasn't died already, uh, or at least nearly died, gone to see the light and come back to tell us all about it. I'm always fascinated by their stories, and as a physician, I've heard uh, you know, many stories about death and witnessed many stories of death in the hospital for the past 40 years. However, the most important one was my mother's death of metastatic breast cancer in 2016. My nephew, Shane, heroically flew 36 hours straight from Australia to take this selfie with her at the bedside on Friday night of Mother's Day weekend. Um, Mom was awake and alert and thrilled to see so many man family members had arrived to, to visit with her. However, the next morning, my brother Peter got an urgent call from the palliative care doctor saying that she was on the way out and we better get there quickly. Uh, we all rushed to the bedside and she had her eyes tightly closed and was breathing very rapidly but could still communicate with us. My sister Christine asked an important question. Mom, what are you experiencing? And she said, it's getting very white in here. And we all took that as a good sign that the end was near. Uh, now, a few minutes later, she quit responding to us and shifted into a rhythmic chant, almost like a mantra saying, it's all right, it's okay, it's all right, it's okay, as if she were attempting to reassure herself that it was safe to go into the light. Um, this continued for about a half an hour, and she rode that mantra right out of this world to the other side. Uh, we were all in awe of the smoothness of her transition. Now, her description of consciousness being flooded with light near the end reminded me of a series of uh, number one best-selling books uh, from the New York Times list in the early 1990s all with light in the title, all about near-death experiences. Uh, two of them, Closer to and Transformed by the Light, were written by pediatrician Melvin Morse. Uh, now, the first book was based on his research published in 1986 on childhood near-death experiences, where he reported all the classic features of leaving the body, going into a tunnel, seeing deceased relatives on the way, and then arriving at a threshold and being sent back from the light into the body. Uh, the second book uh, reported on research about transformation that occurs after near-death experiences. And this research has been confirmed in many peer-reviewed journals since, including this one from 1998. I'm going to talk more about this topic uh, later. Uh, there was a second wave of NDE bestsellers two decades later, beginning in 2012. And reading those books inspired me to write a series of blogs on NDEs, culminating in this one, Spiritual Alphabet Soup, which is the inspiration for this TEDx talk. Uh, I describe four abbreviations for liminal states of death and dying. Uh, and the research uh, on these topics is largely based on subjective reports from the experiencers themselves. Now, NDE occurs in about 4% of the population, according to the research. And NDA is a relatively common occurrence. SDE is a fairly rare event. And ADC is reported to occur in up to 40% of the population. 
I'm going to go through each one of these topics, share a little bit of the science and some of my personal experiences. We begin with the NDE Traits of Transformation reported by Melvin Morse. And I was actually sharing this information with one of my radiology fellows after a year of teaching him how to read MRI scans. We'd never had a single metaphysical discussion the whole year until that last month. And I was, as I was going through these first three traits of transformation, he got very quiet. And then he said, you know, I've never shared this with anyone, but when I was 13, I was in a severe accident, had a head injury, was in a coma for a few days. And when I came back, I was strangely different. I had lost my fear of death. And I'd been the class clown before the accident. And afterwards, I was a straight A student on a mission to go to med school. Uh, I also always seem to know um, who's on the other end of the phone before I pick it up. And then I ask him, so where's your watch? He said, ah, oh, I can't wear it. It stops all the time. My wife gets it fixed. Still doesn't work. And I said, well, that's actually the fourth trait of transformation. Strange electromagnetic phenomena that occur after an NDE. There's even a paper on it from 2015, which not only mentions the... Uh, watch malfunctions, but also talks about uh, cell phone and laptop failures and even lights flickering on and off uh, when the person enters the room. Uh, and these all occur less commonly in people who haven't had near-death experiences. So the next topic is nearing-death awareness, or NDA, and Christopher Kerr is the leading researcher in this field. He's famous for having given a wildly popular TEDx talk called I See Dead People with Over 4 Million Views. It's based on his published 2014 research on deathbed dreams and visions showing that they decrease anxiety in those that are dying. And they sometimes report being uh, greeted by the welcoming committee, which is a group of deceased relatives filling the room that no one else can see. Uh, now, I had an experience of my dad's nearing death awareness Thanksgiving of 1993, when he was in denial of the fact that he was dying of metastatic renal cell cancer. Uh, now, he was a steel mill executive and shared this dream about the rolling mill uh, and trying to get up into the rafters to get a higher perspective on what was going on down in the mill. Now, in a rolling mill, you take a big, thick, hot ingot of steel and roll it down through a series of progressive stands, thinner and thinner and thinner to flatten it out into a sheet and at the end, it's rolled up onto a coil. Now, he said he was uh, looking down between the last stand and where it gets rolled up on the coil. But he had no clue what this dream meant, but I knew immediately. And I, I said, wouldn't it make sense that your subconscious would use uh, symbols you're familiar with from the mill to communicate an important message to you about the fact that you're nearing the end of the line in your life? Uh, that insight into the dream uh, broke through his denial of death and allowed him to have a smoother transition a couple months later. The next topic is shared death experience, or STE, is reported in this article from 2021. Uh, it sometimes occur in relatively intuitive people who are attending at the bedside of the dying person and they go into an altered state of consciousness at the moment of transition. And they actually see the person leave their body and go into the tunnel, and then they go out of their body and follow them into the tunnel up toward the light. When they get to the threshold, they're sent back and the other person continues on into the light and dies. There's also a remote version of this where there's a, a dream or a vision by someone uh, who's not in the room with the dying patient. I think I had a dream that qualifies as one of these in 2000 when my elderly Aunt Betty was dying of chronic lung disease after a long illness. Uh, early that morning, I had a, this vivid dream of seeing her looking younger than her current age in the prime of life and waving at me saying, little Betsy's going home. When I called my mother the next morning, she said, oh yeah, uh, my, her sister had died a couple hours before. I asked her about the little Betsy comment, uh, and she said, oh, that was a nickname only your Uncle Walt used that no one else really used. And I, I was struck with the fact that I'd never have any conscious memory of hearing it, which made the dream all the more interesting. 
Now, the last category is the ADC or after-death communication, which can occur in a dream like in the previous case, but it can also occur in the waking state when psychiatrists would refer to that as a visual hallucination as in this article from 2021. Now, it doesn't matter what you call it, it still has the impact of decreasing grief in the bereaved. Uh, now, these sometimes occur as symbolic messages. And my favorite of these is so-called pennies from heaven. I first heard about this uh, at a lecture at the Ryan Research Center in 2002, uh, where it was described as finding uh, surprising coins in uh, unexpected locations that sometimes have the date of death of, of, a, of a loved one on it. Um, I was teaching a Duke stress management class uh, the next day, and I shared the story with the students saying that my dad had died in 94, and I thought I'd had some after-death communications from him, but never found any mis mysterious coins. Um, at the end of the class, one of my students from the Divinity School came up and said, you know, my dad died prematurely in 1994 also. That very moment, I looked on the map behind me, and there was a shiny coin that I had not seen there before. I picked it up, and held it up to him and said, "You, our fathers both died the same year. I wonder what's going to be the date on this coin. And sure enough, it was a 1994 dime. We were both stunned by the synchronicity. I handed him the coin and said, you know, in your future ministry, uh, you might need this in counseling uh, your bereaved parishioners. And he appreciated it. In conclusion, I'll leave you with this paper from 1996, which showed that students who read books on near-death experiences or listened to a talk like this one reported a reduced fear of death and an increase in spirituality. And I hope that that proves to be true for all of you listening to this talk. I think that's an idea worth spreading.